Hello everyone and welcome to Amanpour and Company in the Ukrainian capital Kyiv. Here's what's coming up. We did not start this war, but Ukrainian society united and showed that it was ready for what unfortunately was such a tragedy. The toll of war. In a global exclusive in Kyiv, I sit down with President Zelensky and the First Lady as they lead their country through Russia's brutal invasion. Then, Ukraine's women on the front lines. We look at the behind the scenes efforts supporting the country's fighting females. Club. Welcome to the program, everyone. I'm Christiane Amanpour in Kyiv, where the country is bracing for what could be the decisive battle in this brutal war. It's the battle for Kherson. Russia's defense minister has ordered the withdrawal of its troops from parts of the region as Ukrainian forces advance towards the city. It seems to be a major setback for Putin's war aims, but Ukrainian officials are expressing skepticism and caution, especially as the Kremlin's top security advisor visits Iran, where Western officials say he's seeking more advanced weapons. President Volodymyr Zelensky wants to ensure international support for his country's defense continues, particularly from the United States after these midterm elections. And at this pivotal time, I sat down with the president and his wife, First Lady Olena Zelenska, for a global exclusive. Their leadership and courage have driven this story and Ukraine's remarkable resistance. But it is clear the war is taking its toll. They were tired but determined. Here's our conversation. President Zelensky, First Lady, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Mr. President, it's been nearly nine months of this war now. Did you expect it to last this long? Do you have any idea of how long it might last? Thank you for the question and thank you for the meeting. You asked whether I thought this war would last so long. No, because I didn't start this war. And I'm sure there isn't a single Ukrainian who knew what this will be and what tragedy this would bring to every home in our country. Because, I'll repeat, we did not start this war, but Ukrainian society united and showed that it was ready for what unfortunately was such a tragedy, showed that it was ready for these challenges. I was really impressed by the power of one nation and was impressed by the swiftness of the response of Europe, the whole world, and the whole international community that rallied around Ukraine for this challenge. First Lady, what motivates you to get up in the morning? How do you feel that you've endured this war? <laughs> Well, thank you. It's a big question. It covers many spheres of my life. And what helps me get up in the morning, um, surely, as you said, it's my husband's example. I know that if he endures, then I have to endure. If the day's begun, then we have to keep fighting. That keeps me going. It's not easy every day, but you know, you need to keep running. You cannot stop. As Alice has said, in order to stay in place, you have to run even faster. That's why we run. And I get some inspiration from the kids, from the children. First and foremost, there are some ordinary things that every family is doing. You need to get your son ready for school. You need to make sure he has had breakfast. Well, unfortunately, I don't have the assurance that my child would go to school every day because of those strikes with missiles and drones. There's a lot of work, a lot of humanitarian projects that we will continue after the war. That helps a lot. Uh, Ms. President, I wanted to ask you how you react. And I know that you all um, monitor Russian casualties and Russian activity uh, on the Ukrainian battlefield. But the Pentagon actually, as a very senior defense official said, and I'm going, to, I'm going to quote to get it right, that Russia has probably lost half of its main battle tanks, used up most of its precision guided weapons in this war, that 80% of their land force is bogged down here, is stuck here in Ukraine. Does that match your figures? And what is your answer to that? I think this more or less corresponds to reality. 
Although, frankly speaking, nobody knows the full reality, especially as regards personnel. Because nobody can tell you precisely how many people died. Nevertheless, we clearly understand that the artillery that was provided as assistance to us from the United States and Europe, it definitely had to break this initiative which Russia launched us on the 24th of February. And we did break this military initiative. We stopped them. We deoccupied a large part of our territory. And this indeed was helped by the artillery and the new technologies. We never resorted to any of the lies that the Russian Federation produces about dirty bombs or nuclear challenges and so on. And I'm very pleased that we are working jointly and responding quickly to that. Straight after Russia's allegations, we invited the IAEA and they verified everything and said it's just another lie from Russia. So I cannot confirm those numbers for sure, but I can say for sure that it is a stunning number, both in terms of heavy weapons and personnel. Are their losses heavier than your losses? Yes, 10 times. I think so, approximately. I can't give you the exact numbers, but there's a very significant difference, because our war tactic is not to throw people, because people are most important, not to use people as cannon fodder. And that's why it is very important to us, whenever we ask our partners for artillery or armoured vehicles, that it is not just about the weapons, but first of all, protection for our military. Uh, Madam First Lady, you just returned from a major tech conference in Lisbon, and I think the world has noted that Ukraine has used technology in a really innovative and effective way. What was your message there, and what do you want the tech world to do for this country? Well, my message was pretty simple, and I hope it was heard. The people gathered there were people who pushed technology forward. These people have an impact on which direction technology and the whole world will move in the future. So my appeal to them was to choose a side what technology they will invent or design. Will this be a technology that kills or a technology that defends? Because we have a wonderful and vivid example. For example, Bellingcat recently conducted their latest investigation and they found a group of IT experts from Russia, young people aged 23, 25. Before the war, they worked in private IT companies and now they're targeting missiles at our buildings. And this is a choice, a conscious choice made by people who know this technology, who have the expertise, are narrow specialists. They chose to be murderers and terrorists. So my appeal to all those thousands of people gathered at the web summit was to make their choice from a moral and ethical standpoint as to what they will do in the future. And really, the technologies help. Mr. President, what is the status of Kherson and the impending battle to retake Kherson? You know, that's a very serious question. And I'll be frank with you, I'll try to answer it in a way that doesn't give you an answer, to be honest. Because these planned military actions, they are discussed in a small circle, but then they're executed in silence. And I really want to have an unpleasant surprise for the enemy and not something they're prepared for. So I'd like to apologize. But at any rate, our people and your public need to know that we're working on some very serious steps with a positive outcome for the citizens of Ukraine and all those communities that support peace in Ukraine. The Russians are observed as digging in very, very hard, some three to four layers all the way down to the south, to the port, um, to the sea. Do you believe that they're mounting a more serious defense of Kherson than perhaps of the other areas that you've liberated? That's right. They have a very powerful defense. And not only me, but our military headquarters, we met. And at first, we didn't believe that they would be running away from Kherson. I believe that this was just an attempt to draw more Ukrainian troops in that direction.
First Lady, we've heard of many Ukrainian children being taken over to Russia. We don't know really what's happening to them. Here in Kyiv and in the area, I've met and watched over the last few days kids who've been obviously traumatized by the war, the air raid sirens frighten the little ones, um, kids who've been told to be quiet and hide quietly, uh, have a difficulty speaking and communicating. Some kids have seen horrible things happen under occupation. Their mothers raped, for instance. Obviously, you're a mother, but you're very involved in the mental health aspect and with your foundation also with women and children. First of all, it's a big tragedy that our children are being taken away to Russia. There's a large number of children who our social services lost connection with, and we can't find them. Sometime in summer, the Russians relaxed their adoption legislation. They simplified the procedure to adopt Ukrainian children, which is horrible, and we understand we'll have to fight for them, and we keep talking about it at all international forums. Currently, we have an agreement on the evacuation of two children's homes from the Odessa region, and there's already an agreement reached with Turkey, we're trying to save them in advance. But just two days ago, I heard the news that a children's home has been moved from the occupied territories in Kherson region. We cannot reach them, unfortunately. We cannot save them. But hopefully, the international community will help us return our children. Now, as regards helping those children who suffered psychologically from the horrors of war, now there's hundreds of these children already. And we can't even imagine what those children suffered, who had to bury their own mother in the yards of their homes, who saw their relatives murdered, who stayed in the basements of Mariupol. We can only observe them and try to help. And for that purpose, we are establishing a national program on mental health and psychosocial support, which I hope will have a lot of projects for kids. I can give you an example. Once fairly successful, I believe, we organized a camp together with Ukrainian psychologists and donors. There were 20 kids with psychological issues. We took them to a special camp where the tutors were psychologists. They spent 20 days in Spain under constant 24-hour psychological monitoring, and this therapy had wonderful results. The children who didn't speak started speaking. The children who had eating disorders, who didn't eat at all, and there was a boy who never slept. The tutors had to sleep beside him because he could only sleep if there was somebody next to him. And indeed, we saw wonderful results. We want to scale up this project. We are supported by experts from Israel and Belgium. The next training destination for our specialists will be the UK. Very soon, this month, we will be sending our psychologists and psychotherapists for training there. We choose the world's best practices for coping with PTSD. I can see it makes you very sad, both of you. I can see you listening to your wife and, and this assault on the children is difficult to take. It's difficult to live with this. I believe the main thing is not to get used to living with it, but to fight it, as Olena said, with various programs. Mr. President, you've obviously heard there are all these articles being written, there are these foreign policy analysts who are saying, isn't enough already for you? Do you should you go to the negotiating table? Um, some of these countries with economic pressures on their own who are supporting you now. Are, they, are, you, are you feeling any pressure to go to the negotiating table? Look, they don't want this war to be finished. Now, before having any fatigue, everyone has to understand that it's only the Kremlin and only one person, the head of the Russian Federation, who's not tired of the war. He might be tired of life in principle because of his age, but he's definitely not tired of the war. Now this person and the Russian political and military leadership need a pause. Believe me, they can feel it. They've begun to feel the effect of the sanctions. They have begun to feel dissatisfaction in their society. This person and all of them are afraid only of our society. These people unfortunately have no voice. Because if they weren't afraid of going to the streets, they would exert pressure. And this is what the Russian leadership is afraid of. And then, for our part, we say, please, respect our principles of the UN Charter. 
Please respect our territorial integrity. Please respect our people, our rights, our freedom, our land, and our choice. That's it. So this word, fatigue, is a big word. You can't get fatigued. So it's too early for all of us to get fatigued. But when Russia truly wants peace, we will definitely feel it and see that. But, you know, you can't wish for peace with words alone. Words are not enough. Stop the war. Withdraw from the territory. Stop killing people. Start reimbursing the damages inflicted on our country. Criminals must be prosecuted. So words are not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, do you still stand by what you said a few months ago, that you would not negotiate with Vladimir Putin? His proposal has no substance as regards ending the war. Other than ultimatums, I've not heard anything from the current president of the Russian Federation. Starting from the 24th of February, there have been only ultimatums, denazification, denationalization. Every issue they raise starts with a D. They always want to deprive us of something violently on our own land. So I said that I'm not going to talk to this person if this person conducts these sham referendums and recognizes all those sham authorities that they set up as legal. We said this clearly, and I said that if they do that, then this means they don't respect our people, our sovereignty, our rights and our freedoms. What is there to talk to them about? But I haven't closed the door. I said we would be ready to talk to Russia, but with a different Russia. One that is truly ready for peace. One that is ready to recognize that they are occupiers. Ready to reimburse our people. That's not about money. They need to return everything, land, rights, freedom, money, and most importantly, justice to parents who lost their children. Money is not enough. It's not a priority. Bring back justice. And so far, I haven't heard statements like that from the Russian Federation, either from Putin or from anyone else. The issue of NATO is very, you know, charged one. I am assuming you're putting NATO to the future, but are you trying to get, and are you confident that you will get, security guarantees. Ukraine needs security guarantees. The world needs security guarantees for Ukraine because stability depends on it. And this relates to the fatigue you mentioned. After our victory, after peace, we don't want to come back to the same situation. And it might happen. As I told you, the current military and political leadership of Russia needs a pause in one form or another, just like with the Minsk agreement or some other agreements, they needed a pause. They would gather up their strength, money, weapons. They would get ready. They would lay out the information for their own society. And when all of that has been prepared, they start the offensive. Because there is only one goal, to destroy our independence. There's no other goal in place. That's why we need security guarantees. Absolutely, we want it. And we believe we have already demonstrated our forces' capability to the world by the level of training, by the resilience of our defense system. I believe that we're at the same level as NATO member countries, at least. And I think it would be fair if we were in the same security circle and same security alliance. Because there are no wars among NATO countries inside NATO. So for us, this is the most secure construct. But if that path is longer than we would want it to be, unfortunately, through some personal attitudes of the leaders of some countries. Again, I'd like to stress the leaders, not societies, because all the societies definitely support us. If that path is longer than we can afford, then while on this path, we would need security guarantees to be able to reach NATO membership, because everyone keep saying that the doors to NATO are open, but you need to reach these doors. 
I'm going to ask you this because you went not so many months ago to the Congress, actually. You also met with President Biden. You met with the First Lady. And you actually said, we need weapons. Send us the weapons. Do you feel that you have the weapons now to actually win? Do you feel that NATO is here to help you win or just to stop you losing? <laughs> I think the president knows better how much more we need. I'm sure we need much more. But as a citizen of Ukraine, as a mother and a wife, I can feel that we need it. Because the missiles keep coming. When they stop coming, when our people stop dying in their beds in the morning, I will feel, OK, maybe that's enough. But we can't wait for Russians to run out of their supplies. It would be wonderful for them to run out. But I guess that's fantasy. That's why I asked to protect our children, to protect all of us. It's hard to live under this burden every day, when you don't know what will happen tomorrow, when missiles hit the crossroads while people are driving to work and get killed on the way. The other part of that missile hit a children's playground in Shevchenko Park. I literally walked there with my children when they were young. I'm really happy that it was 8 a.m. and there were no children yet. And I'm happy that my children are older and we weren't there. But this brings it closer and closer. So the question of weapons is a question of our survival, the survival of us and our children. Mr. President, after all your powerful calls to the world for help, weaponry, most especially, training, all that kind of intelligence help that you've needed, are they finally delivering what you need to win? And do you feel that you're getting enough to win or just not to lose? I think my wife answered it very well. But the answer is fairly simple. It's enough when you can no longer hear explosions. It's enough when the air defense system ensure no missiles hit the ground or buildings. It's enough when you're not being fired at and no missiles are launched against you because Russia is working together with its partner, if I may call it that, with Iran. Since the 10th of October, we've seen them use around 450 kamikaze drones, attack drones, air reconnaissance, attack drones, kamikaze drones, missiles. Over this time, we've had over 2,500 hits. That's without artillery. 2,500 hits by drones, explosives or missiles. That's a large number. Do we have enough defences? No, I don't think we have enough at all. Is it enough to make a hundred or thousand calls? Probably not enough either. Too few. But I'm ready to make a thousand calls if every call I make results in more air defence systems. I'm ready to stay on the phone and just do that. It's difficult. A joint decision on the protection of Ukraine and Ukrainian airspace will definitely help us. And all the answers are there. I'm sorry, it's not even like the start of the COVID epidemic. When people didn't know what to do about it, when we needed to create a vaccine and it didn't exist, there is a vaccine against Russian strikes and we know it. There's a vaccine against Russia and we know exactly which countries have it and in what amounts. And I would say frankly, there are even countries that have a surplus amount from my point of view. So I guess in answer to your question, there is not enough willingness, I would say. What strength do you get from each other? No. No, not, not, not together, not together. It means, it means how we help each other. Yes, and what strength ah. do you get, do <laughs> what you get from, from each you other? What I have from you and what you have from me. Yes. I know what you have from me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know. Yeah. If I can. Yes. That, that, that is my love and that is my best friend. So that is my energy. I wanted to answer your question at the very beginning, when Olena told you like she prepared breakfast for, for the children in the morning and prepare clothes and etc. Uh, and and what what I wanted to tell you that, uh, but I have no such possibility. So 
Nobody gives me breakfast <laughs> in the morning. I, I mean that it's such such uh, such difficult period. Because you're living apart. Yeah. Is it true that you said to President Biden when they offered to evacuate you at the beginning that you said, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition? Doc? Yes, that's right. N nothing changed. You know, my answer is still the same. And I want to ask you another question because I've noticed that Ukrainians are not afraid to poke the bear. So the bear is the Russian bear, and you guys are constantly poking on the ground in the battle, in the airwaves, in the Twitter accounts of the Ministry of Defense, all over. A lot of people outside are afraid of Russia and what Russia might, might do. Where did this come from? You know, I think that Russia feeds on these fears. And I think this is a big mistake of the last few decades. Russia feels it has this power. The more you give it, the more it feels your fear. It lives by it. I think historically we've been under pressure for so long, it's no longer scary. It's not even interesting. We just want it to stop. It's more of an emotion rather than a fear. The centuries of Russian Empire, then dozens of years of Soviet Union, with all these famines, with all the repressions, with all the expulsions of Ukrainians to Siberia and Kazakhstan, we've suffered so much from them that if we don't put an end to this now, there may be no chance in the future. This is our last stand. And when it is a last stand, we've all seen it in the movies, there's only one winner. And of course, our sole desire is to be that winner. Otherwise, we will have no future for this nation, because everything that's happening is elimination on ethnic grounds. All these calls for denazification, this is all about the Ukrainian nation being wrong, not having a right of exi to exist. The Ukrainian language is not a real language, it's just bad Russian. It's all about losing the values, there are no values for humanity. This is something we can never put up with, really, because it would mean rejecting ourselves. Therefore, there is no fear. There is resilience, there's bravery. All we need is swifter and more powerful support than we're getting now. And this dignity, Ukrainian dignity, is very important. And that's why we have this resilience. Russia keeps wondering, What's happening here? I don't understand why they're so keen to know what we're up to. I think they should be more interested in their own country, in their own history, in their own culture, to preserve it, if they still have it. Do you think the women are getting enough support? Tell me what this says about your country, that there's a huge level of women comparative to other NATO countries in the military and actually on the front line. I think that the number of women who volunteered to join the armed forces, there's almost 40,000. That speaks for itself. These are the women who chose the path of the military in wartime, not in peacetime, when it would be more of a military romantic idea. There is a shortage of purely female things in the uniform, uh, there's only male underwear in the army. Women in the armed forces are still unique, but it's not unique in Ukraine anymore. And this whole war, it continues our path towards gender equality. And we've already made great strides in this. So this war is as equal as Ukrainian society. I'm certain that after this war, women's rights will be even stronger. We've already made strides, and we already have women generals. Bravery has no gender. Thank you very much. Thank indeed. you so much. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Bravery has no gender indeed. And as you just heard the First Lady say, many of those females fighting for Ukraine are lacking the right stuff. And we visited a small hub here in Kyiv that has already delivered a million dollars worth of kit just for women to the front lines. The NGO says its entire effort comes from crowdfunding and grants. At a nondescript storefront in Kyiv, covered with plastic against prying eyes, a major war effort is underway. Aww. Boxes of kit reveal a first of its kind. 
fatigues designed for a mother-to-be. So was there never, Andre, anything for pregnant women before? Never ever. Now, how many pregnant women are fighting the Russians? I'm not sure that a lot, but there are. Andre and Ksenia are married TV journalists in real life who now do this work. A female friend turned frontline sniper told them that she was pregnant and needed a new uniform. They're also sending female soldiers smaller boots, lighter Kevlar plates for their flak vests. On this day, Roxolana comes in for a new uniform. She's in an intelligence unit near the front and joined up in March totally unprepared. It's so valuable to have these people who understand that we are tired of wearing clothes that are three sizes too big, she tells me. We had no helmets, we had old flat jackets, we wore tracksuits and sneakers. Now we feel that we're humans. The Ukrainian Ministry of Defense says there are more than 50,000 women under arms, more than 5,000 of them on the front line. Amongst them, Andre's sister. She received a men's uniform, men's underwear, everything <laughs> that designed for men. Females also need customized sanitary, medical and humanitarian supplies. Ksenia and Andre have sent out 3,000 of these care packages. They've produced 300 uniforms and plan for at least another 2,000, all winterized. And then, uh, there's this vital tool. Oh my God, I yeah. have never seen that. A feminine urinary director for women yeah. of all ages. Well, Basically, they pee in that, right? If there's well, no, no toilet. No, not in. Uh, they pee like men. Look at that. Oh, my God. If only I'd known that in all the years I was in the field. And as a parting gift, they throw in this book on resilience and courage amid battle and in captivity. <laughs> which is what happened to Alina Palina five months ago after the fall of Mariupol. She is part of a canine border guard unit and like so many of the port city's defenders, she had been hunkering down in the giant Azovstal steel plant. She was recently released as part of an all-female prisoner exchange with Russia. We meet at this pizza bar run by vets. Were you prepared for life as a POW? No, I was not, she says. And we discuss this a lot with the other women prisoners, that life hasn't trained us for such an ordeal. While in captivity, though, I said I'll continue my service and I have no plans to stop. Back at their private procurement center, Andre says he wishes he could join his sister, father and brother-in-law all at the front. But a physical disability means that he's not eligible. For a man, it's kind of hard to to understand that you can't go there and your sister is there. So I'm trying to do my best here to help not only my family, but the whole army. And the reviews from the battlefield are in. It's just amazing, says Anastasia. I'm happy as a child. The uniform is ideal, it looks great, and the fabric is very sturdy. Meantime, Roxolana's new boots are made for marching all the way back to the front.